Welcome to the age of robotic exploration. We are living in a truly exciting time, surrounded by autonomous systems in the air, on the surface, and underwater that are allowing us to explore and learn about the natural world. But what life lessons can we learn from these robotic explorers? What lessons for our life can we learn from these robot explorers? Once upon a time, there was a young boy who dreamed of building robots and exploring the oceans. You see, he grew up in Seattle along the shores of the Puget Sound, surrounded by water and the lure of the sea. Half Greek, half Norwegian, and 100% in love with the idea of exploring the watery bits of our planet. In a time before the internet, before social media, when our computer games were very rudimentary, my friends and I occupied ourselves and challenged ourselves by constantly making things and exploring the natural world. We would make forts out of picnic tables. We would make go-karts out of spare plywood. And we would play in the dirt with our transformer toys, imagining a time when they might someday be real. We were allowed to dream big and fail spectacularly. Fast forward 30-some years, and I've been very privileged to be able to continue that passion and work with my students developing and utilizing autonomous systems in far-flung places around the world. One of the most challenging things about ocean exploration is the commute. Being air-breathing land mammals, getting access to the big blue is a very challenging thing. We can't dive very deep and we can't stay down very long. So autonomous systems give us eyes in the air, like drones that can give us an eagle's eye view of a beach after a storm. Or autonomous surface vessels, unmanned boats, that can give us prolonged access into the sea even long after the time that humans could, could, could endure or when conditions might be too rough. And underwater, our autonomous underwater vehicles give us literally ears into the environment. And suddenly, our commute has gotten a whole lot better. And so we have developed and utilized a vast array of autonomous systems, robots of every shape and size that give us unprecedented access to that marine, and, uh, marine environment. And so with all of these toys to play with, and we call them assets, sometimes I'll have a colleague who might quip, uh, like my good friend Dr. Varone, who might say in his charming French accent, wow, exploring the ocean with robots sounds super exciting. You must be some sort of modern-day robotic Jacques Cousteau. And I have to tell him, sadly, mon ami, no. My goal is to be boring, to be very, very boring. Less Adventure equals more science. Adventure is what we are trying to avoid. Adventure is what we get when we don't get what we want. Working with autonomous systems, we learn that over time after time that it is about prolonged periods of boredom punctuated by moments of sheer and utter panic. Boring is good. And so, my friends, we are living in an age of robotics, okay? Do you want proof? Okay, show of hands. How many of you have had, had a robot that has helped you with some task? Perhaps it's helped you to vacuum the floor at your home or at a neighbor's or at the office. Good. Okay, how many of you, maybe you flew a drone over a holiday period or helped a child put together a Lego robotics kit? Or maybe how many of you used a bot, some smart device, to give you today's weather or help you navigate from one location to another? Look, we even once had a Terminator as the governor of California. The age of robots is upon us. And for those of you who are robots in the audience, I say to you, 10010110. Thank you for being here. But what is it about these autonomous systems? And I do prefer that term, although you'll find out I'll, I'll, I'll flip between that one and robot. The term robot comes from a story about a mechanical slave, and autonomy is the direct antithesis of servitude. So I'll try to suggest we use autonomous systems, but you might hear me use both. These things are good at the four Ds, dirty, dull, daring, dangerous. Tasks that are dirty, dull, dangerous, and daring. I'll give you a, I'll give you a tour. Come with me. So how do we go about filling in the blank spots on the map of our planet? We do it by mowing the lawn. How many of you like mowing the lawn? Mm, yeah, me neither, okay? Uh, and that, is, is that monotony, that, that routine tasking is the key element for how we go about mapping our oceans. We send out pulses of sound waves as we, as we move back and forth across the surface, filling in, allowing us to paint a picture 
of what the seafloor looks like. As you're seeing here, this colorful image that shows just after Superstorm Sandy what happened from that storm to an artificial reef site off Delaware comprised of hundreds upon hundreds of former New York City subway cars. And so while the robots can go out and do the mowing the lawn, the human operators can saw logs. When things are going well, it's really boring. And at the end of the mission, then, the robots come back, we download our data, we process it, now we can visualize, we can illuminate parts of the depth, deep corals in the twilight zone depths of the Caribbean that had never before been seen. And then we wash, rinse, and repeat, and we send our robotic explorers back out into the water on a cold winter's day, and the human operators have a very dull time watching submarine races from the surface. All the while, the robot is executing that monotonous lawn mowing back and forth, allowing us to uncover the secrets of a World War I shipwreck. Or we'll send a surface vessel, autonomous surface vessel, back and forth in the bay, in the Delaware Bay to investigate damage from a storm. Or we'll take a drone up in the air over a pea green soup pond that is blooming with toxic, harmful algae, keeping a nice safe distance for the human operators. Other times we'll send our underwater vehicles right into harm's way in order to search for and perhaps help neutralize unexploded ordnance munition remnants from our, our military past. And many times, it's really the human operators that struggle the most, sometimes holding on by our mere fingertips in the endeavor to get to our, to our field site. Sometimes the most challenging thing is getting to where we're trying to go. Meanwhile, our, our autonomous systems wait coolly and calmly on the surface, waiting for us to execute the commands for them to go on the next adventure. And the other is to dive deeply into the Aegean Sea and help find fragments of ancient shipwrecks in the Aegean. We call upon our autonomous systems to go where we dare not or cannot go. And now we're finding ourselves in this exciting time, the do-it-yourself maker revolution, where we can open up this opportunities for discovery to a new cohort of collaborators in exploration. By lowering that entry point, no longer is it just exploration for a few, but it could be for many. And now, like the children we once were, we're suddenly playing with real-life transformers. Transformers, autonomous systems that are taking battery energy and the sweat off of our brows and turning that into scientific discovery. It sounds exciting, doesn't it? Well, it's not. At least 99% of the time, it really is not. Uh, and we have to find other ways to entertain ourselves. Uh, while the missions are going on. And in fact, anyone who works with autonomous systems will tell you that the definition of a good day is a day when the robot comes home. These are the relieved and happy faces from following a very sleepless night and a very challenging morning, but that luckily ended with the robot coming home. Because unfortunately, that's not always the case. Oceanographers and field roboticists over the years, we have had to say goodbye too soon to many of our friends along the way. From auto sub lost under the ice in the, the, in the Antarctic, still there, uh, to Abe and Nereus imploded in the deep blue sea, to our very own Dory who sank and flooded in the Black Sea. And sometimes we sort of couch it in, in some cold consolation and we'll say to ourselves, well, don't put it in the water unless you're prepared to lose it. But how many of you are parents in the audience? Raise your hand. Okay. I ask you to think back to a time where you're at the mall, you're at this store somewhere, a crowded place, and your child's gone missing for just even a few brief moments, or they're supposed to come home at an appointed time and they haven't showed up. That feeling in your gut, that cold, palpable sweat feeling is the exact same feeling that every autonomous systems operator feels when a system doesn't come home. I went through a period of very personal a mourning and sadness and sorrow when my first AUV was lost and flooded in the Black Sea. But we pick up and we move on. And we are reminded at other times, the ocean reminds us quite vividly that she is a place with hungry, bitey things. Okay, this is the time we had a shark eat, swallow whole one of our little sensors, never to be, never to be seen again. At other times, we get a chance 
We get a chance such as the time where we knew that we had a vehicle trapped in Poseidon's grip, more than 500 feet down, trapped in a limestone cave in the Caribbean. And we had to go in and try to manage a rescue for it. And we managed to search and find and rescue one robot with another robot at the end of a tether. And we were reminded that day that with robots as with people, it's better to travel in pairs. And yet there is somehow this this common misconception that somehow working with autonomous systems is deprived and, and bereft of human involvement. Nothing could be further from the truth. Human engagement and activity is required every step along the way. This is what robotic exploration looks like. And this is autonomous exploration. And this, and this, and again this. And in fact, at times, there are so many people milling about that it's difficult to see the robots for all the people. From the engineers who help us build and test the systems to the scientists who conceive of the missions to our students and technicians who learn how to utilize and push the technology into new and exciting and more complicated venues, there are human hands, many, many human hands involved in every step along the way. And in fact, the humans, we retain a very special element, that most human of the elements, the aha moment of discovery. The aha moment of discovery where after it happens now in sequence, lagging slightly from the robotic exploration, but we still have that moment, that opportunity where we, the human operators, have to decode, decipher, put the findings into the proper context. And so we find ourselves now in a world increasingly surrounded by autonomous systems. And I've been spent most of my career developing utilizing and sometimes agonizing over autonomous systems. And I've learned some life lessons that I wanted to impart on you today. One is, boring doesn't just happen. You have to work on it. That to be the early adopter is fraught with challenges, whether it's a new idea, a new technique, or a new concept. But the view is extraordinary. That there will be losses, but that we must risk failure for success. And we must learn from those losses. That we must build and cultivate a culture of tribal knowledge, sharing the lessons and the mistakes that we've learned with others. That when we think we are autonomous and all on our own, we are actually dependent on a great many people, institutions, and things around us. That there will be challenges along the way that we must work the problem to overcome. And that it is crucial and important to have someone outside of your group to review your mission plan whether that is the mission plan for your autonomous vehicle or the mission plan for your life. And remember, boring is good. Boring is best. Thank you.